Let's open our Bibles together to John 13th chapter. We will pick up in verse 17 and look at verses 17 through 30 of John chapter 13. Please listen attentively to God's word. I do not speak of all of you. I know the ones I have chosen, but it is that the scripture may be fulfilled. He who eats my bread has lifted up his heel against me. From now on, I am telling you before it comes to pass, so that when it does occur, you may believe that I am. Truly, truly, I say to you, he who receives whomever I send receives me, and he who receives me receives him who sent me. When Jesus had said this, he became troubled in spirit and testified and said, truly, truly, I say to you that one of you will betray me. The disciples began looking at one another at a loss to know of which one he was speaking. There was reclining on Jesus' bosom one of his disciples, whom Jesus loved. So Simon Peter gestured to him and said to him, tell us who it is of whom he is speaking. He, leaning back thus on Jesus' bosom, said to him, Lord, who is it? Jesus then answered, That is the one for whom I shall dip the morsel and give it to him. So when he had dipped the morsel, he took and gave it to Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot. After the morsel, Satan then entered into him. Therefore, Jesus said to him, what you do, do quickly. Now, no one of those reclining at the table knew for what purpose he had said this to him, For they were supposing, because Judas Judas had the money box, that Jesus was saying to him, buy the things we have need of for the feast, or else that he should give something to the poor. So after receiving the morsel, he went out immediately, and it was night. Father, teach us from your word today. Fill our hearts with your spirit. Fill this room with your spirit. It's a dark setting and a dark passage, and yet you are the light that shines in the darkness. May we all have ears to hear and hearts to understand what is here. For we ask in Jesus' name, amen. So we're in this last hours of Jesus' life. If you remember last week, we looked at the beginning of this section, they're in the upper room. And they, Jesus has gathered together his 12 disciples, 12 apostles, and he knows that within hours he is going to be executed for things he did not do. And he has this last group meeting with those most intimate of fellows, of friends, to give them final words before his death. So they're in this upper room, this, uh, this the wealthy man has offered this place to them. And Jesus says, as I read in verse 18, Jesus says, I do not speak of all of you. Now, he has just pronounced a blessing upon these men. Uh, We looked last week at the foot washing, where Jesus took on the, the role of a slave and washed the feet of his disciples And then he said, go and do what I'm telling you, do what I'm doing, wash the feet of one another. We talked about how that is uh, the, the model set for us today. And so I'm sure if I took a moment and asked any of you, did you wash someone's feet today, we wouldn't have time to hear all the testimonies of how many people washed somebody's feet today or yesterday or this week, right? Yeah, yeah. Okay, good. So you all obeyed the word of God last week and everybody has clean feet this morning. Excellent. So he's saying we are all to take the role of the servant in our attitude toward other believers. 
How can I serve you? And he says, you are blessed if you do this. I'm pronouncing a blessing over you if you do this. But then he says, but I don't mean all of you. It's very similar to what he said just a few verses earlier when he said, I will cleanse you. I have cleansed you. You remember the interaction with Peter. If I've cleansed you, you are clean. But he says, not all of you are clean. There is one sitting around the tables or reclining around the tables who is not clean. He says, I'm not speaking to all of you. He says, I know the ones I have chosen. Remember, Jesus chose all 12 of these. These people, these men did not sign up to follow Jesus. They didn't sign up to be apostles. That's not how you become an apostle. Uh, he, he doesn't cast out a, a, a form and say, hey, anybody interested in being an apostle, come on and, and follow me. No, he walked around and said, hey, you two, come follow me. You, come follow me. You, come follow me. And at some point, he looked at Judas and he said, Judas, come follow me. And Judas did. He says, I know whom I've chosen, but there is a scripture that must be fulfilled And he quotes from Psalm 41, he who eats my bread has lifted up his heel against me. If you go back and read Psalm 41, it's a Psalm of David, and he's he's confessing his sin, but he's also describing the oppression and persecution that he's experiencing, uh, and especially someone who he trusted a friend, and he says, this friend has turned on me. Now, if you've been a Christian very long, and if you've read the Bible very long, you know how this works, but let me just remind us that everything in the Old Testament, from Genesis through Malachi, all those stories in the Old Testament, they all point to Jesus. Either they set the historical setting for the coming of Jesus, or there are events that lay the groundwork for what Jesus is going to do, or there are metaphors and illustrations in what is done, like the temple and the sacrifices and those kind of things, or we have what's called typology, where there are, there are individuals who in some ways point to Jesus in their very lives. Their lives are a pattern for what Jesus is going to do. So we read through the Old Testament and we see the story of Jesus told all over the place. Again, in the sacrifices, the the animals that are sacrificed are are pointers to Jesus being sacrificed. And the priest, Jesus shows up and he becomes our high priest, fulfilling everything that the priests did in the Old Testament. Well, one of those great uh, pictures of the coming Messiah is David, King David. He's going to be the one who reigns over the, the household of God forever. And he's the shepherd who is transformed into the king and all of those things. So that's all King David. Well, David's life gives us a lot of anticipations of what's going to be true of Jesus. And on one occasion, David is betrayed by his own son. And David has to flee the city of Jerusalem. And he takes the people who are loyal to him with him. And he's got a man named Ahithophel. If any of you are looking for baby names, that's a good one to think about. Ahithophel, and Ahithophel was his uh, fellow counselor. He ate at the king's table, and he advised David on strategies, and David trusted him. He was in the inner circle of David's court, but when David flees Jerusalem because of his son Absalom, Ahithophel turns on David and is loyal to David's son Absalom. And you just wonder if that's not who David has in mind when he writes Psalm 41 and he says, here is a man who ate bread at my table and now he has picked up his heel against me. Probably that imagery is he has walked out. He's lifted up his heel to walk out on me and abandon me in my time of need. You ever been betrayed by a friend? All of us have, haven't we? And you think about sitting at your table, someone that was in your, almost in your family, someone you trusted, someone you spent time with, had the intimacy of meals together, and you thought, they're on my side, they're on my team, we're for each other, and then they turn on you. 
They walk away, say things that are damaging to you, and become loyal to your enemy, so to speak. We've all had that happen to us. Is there a more lonely feeling in the entire world than someone you counted a friend, a trusted friend, not just an acquaintance, not someone who casually said, hey, I, I, you know, I appreciate what you're doing, but someone who's really for you, and then for whatever reason, they turn. No, actually, probably none of us will name our children Ahithophel. No more than we would name our children Benedict Arnold. You know, he was a faithful soldier for a long time. It could be argued that the Americans would have lost the war if it weren't for Benedict Arnold. But at some point he turned and abandoned Washington and the rest and joined the enemy. And none of us are going to name our children Judas. Jude, maybe, so we can sing Hey Jude to them, but not Judas, because the connotations of a Judas is a betrayer, someone who is in the inner circle of Jesus and then picks up his heel and walks away. Jesus gives them a, a couple other statements. We'll come back to these in a moment. And then in verse 21, it says, when Jesus had said this, he became troubled in spirit. There's that word again, troubled. We've seen this a couple times already. Jesus experiences in his inner man, in his, in his spirit, in his soul, his emotions, he has a visceral response. He is agitated and pained in his heart at what he's going to say. He testifies, he bears witness to the truth, and he says to them, truly, truly, I say to you, one of you will betray me. Can you imagine that? Can you imagine being in that inner circle, being one of those 12? And Jesus is visibly shaken, he's disturbed. He looks around at these men, he said, one of you are going to betray me. Disciples look around each other. It says they're at a loss. Who? Who is it? The other gospel writers tell us that they began to say to him one by one, surely it's not me, Lord, not me. I'm not the one, am I? And they're confused. I mean, they've been together for three years, a band of brothers, serving, doing amazing things. Jesus had sent them throughout the city to do amazing things. And they were, they were loyal to one another and nobody had a doubt about anybody else around this table. And Jesus says, one of you is going to turn on me. So they're wondering. And what's remarkable about this passage? For the first time, Peter doesn't speak up. He has a thought. But he doesn't speak up. He says to John, hey, John, John, ask him, who is it? Now, the, the way they're, they're gathered here, uh, it, again, if you've seen da Vinci's portrait of the Last Supper, he got this all wrong. They're not sitting around the table, the long table kind of thing. Um, that's not how it was. They, most of the time when they gathered together, they would sit at tables, but on special occasions, they would recline. That word is, is important. The reclining is, it was a pagan uh, festival setting that at first when it came to uh, Jerusalem, the Jews rejected because it was uh, too much associated with the, uh, the Feast of Bacchanalia and the debauchery that went on there. But like everything else in paganism, eventually it softened, and the Jews began to adopt this particular form of sitting together or lying together. And, and so in this setting, we have the, the Jesus and the disciples reclining. So if you remember last week, I talked about how there was probably a table kind of like this, low to the floor, and going this way, kind of a U-shape. And Jesus would have been here reclining on his left arm, and then right here in front of him would have been John, and possibly, in the place of prestige right behind Jesus, was Judas. 
Now, we don't know that for sure, but because of how the dialogue goes, we know John is here. It seems like Judas was right there. And Peter is somewhere else. And so John is right here in front of Jesus. Jesus is leaning like this. And Peter goes, John, ask him. Find out who's going to betray him. And so John right here just has to lean his head back and say, Lord, who? Which one? Which one of us is going to turn his back on you and betray you? Jesus says, privately, it sounds like, it seems like it's, it's fairly soft here. This is the one for whom I shall dip the morsel and give it to him. Uh, the, the way they often ate their bread was they took the piece of bread and they dipped it into the wine and then ate the bread that way. Some of you maybe have taken communion that way, which follows uh, the, the tradition here. So Jesus took a piece of bread and he dipped it into the wine and probably John rears back asking the question, Jesus answers, he reaches over, grabs the bread, dips in the wine, and gives it to Judas. After the morsel, it says, Satan entered into him. That's the term entered into that is common in the New Testament for demon possession. So prior to this, we're told that, that Satan had put into Judas's heart to betray Jesus, and Judas went and made the deal with the Pharisees, the leaders, the chief priests, for 30 pieces of silver. And here, Satan enters into Judas and takes full control. This is the climactic event, heading toward here, the climactic event of all of human history. Think about the Old Testament. All the way back to the beginning, God creates the heaven and the earth. It's beautiful, it's wonderful, and it is good. In fact, it's better than good. God says it is very good. He fills the earth with animals and creatures and plants and all that. He puts Adam and Eve here and says, this is really good. This is very good. And Adam and Eve are doing their thing, and they're cultivating the garden, and they're having a great time, and then the snake shows up. That's right. You hear the hiss of the snake. And Satan comes into that beautiful garden, and he says, Eve, come here. Let me get this straight. Did God really say that you're not allowed to eat any of this produce, any of the fruit trees, any of this beautiful vegetation? Did he say you can't eat from any of it? And he says, no, 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 that's not what he said. He just said, there's one in the middle. We can't eat it or touch it. And Satan says, God's a liar. You're not going to die. See, God knows that if you eat that tree's fruit, you're going to be just like him. And he doesn't want you to be like him. He's afraid of what will happen if you become like him. He's holding out on you, Eve. He's deceiving you so that you won't become godlike. And you know what happened. Eve takes the fruit. She says, mm, this looks good. This will make me wise like God. I like it. I'm going to eat it. Takes it to her husband, standing right there, watching his whole thing. The husband who should have taken out his hatchet and chopped the head off that snake. But instead, he allows his wife to disobey God's explicit command. And he then takes a bite as well and disobeys God's explicit command. And we know the history that follows God judges the entire universe because of that sin. And God gave very specific curses. To the man, he said, your labor is going to be hard. When we work and things don't go the way they're supposed to, that's Adam's fault. Feel free to curse Adam when things don't go the way they should. God cursed him. Ladies, when you're giving birth and it hurts, it is not your husband's fault. I feel like I have to reiterate that every time. It is not his fault. It's Eve's fault. Because pain in childbirth 
is part of the punishment on women because of their sin. But you remember what he said to the snake? Remember what he said to Satan himself? At the snake level, you're going to be on your belly, and you're going to eat dust. But there's a deeper meaning behind what he says next. He says to the serpent, your offspring and the offspring of the woman are going to be in constant conflict. There is going to be a battle that rages. The seed of the woman and the seed of the serpent. And as we trace through the Old Testament history, we see these two lines, if you will. There are some who are faithful to God. That's the seed of the woman. There are a whole lot more who are not faithful to God. That's the offspring of the snake. And in some ways, we could describe the entire Old Testament as this battle between those who are faithful to God and those who are not faithful to God. And God says to the serpent, someday, the woman's offspring, the woman's descendant, is going to crush your head. And you will crush or bruise his heel. That's a prophecy. And it's thousands of years before this setting in the upper room. But now the time has come where the snake is going to bruise the heel of the woman's offspring. He thinks he's winning. Satan has roamed around like a, a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. He tried to devour Jesus himself. Do you remember? He led him out into the wilderness. Well, the Spirit led him out of the wilderness, and Satan met him out there and said, Hey, Jesus, are you really the Son of God? Are you really the promised one? Prove it. Prove it. I know you're hungry. You haven't eaten for 40 days. Turn that stone into bread if you're really the Son of God. And, of course, God, uh, Jesus says, No, I'm not going to obey you. Man doesn't live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God, I will not do that because you're the one who's asking. Oh, yeah? Well, just bow down to me, and I'll give you all these kingdoms. Jesus says, absolutely not. I'm not going to submit to you, Satan. Well, throw yourself off the temple. The Bible says angels will come and rescue you. He says, no, I won't, because I'm not going to give in to your temptations. I'm not doing what you tell me to do. Satan wanted to devour Jesus himself, but, of course, Jesus held true to the word of God. So then he went looking for somebody else, and in Judas, he found a willing recipient. What we know about Judas is, from the very beginning, he was a crook. He was pilfering the whole time. He was the keeper of the money of the, of the apostles. And as people would give and donate to the ministry of Jesus, Judas would take some off the top for himself. He wasn't a believer any part of the time. He acted like one. He looked like one. He did what the others did. But his heart was far from the Lord, and Satan took advantage and entered in to Judas. And in this moment, Jesus looks at Judas, and he says, what you do, do quickly. He's talking to two people there, isn't he? Satan has just taken possession of Judas, and Judas looks him right in the eye. He says to Judas and to Satan, what you're going to do, get after it. So he left. The disciples still don't, don't know what's going on, they're thinking, oh, he's telling Judas to go buy something or go give money to the poor, which was common at Passover time. They don't get it. And he goes out, and it's ominous how John ends verse 30, and it was night. Yes, it's after sun, sundown, but that's not the point. Darkness is coming. 
Satan thought he had won. Think about what the end of this is. Judas is going to lead the Jews to arrest Jesus and put him to death. And Satan is going to cheer. I did it. What I started in the garden, I finished in Jerusalem, just outside the city, and I win. Paul comes along later and he writes to the Corinthians and he says, if the rulers of this world had understood what was really going on, they would have never crucified the Lord of glory. There was deeper magic. There was a plan that Satan did not know. This was the way that God was going to turn everything upside down and save his people. But Satan wasn't privy to that plan. He thought he had won. This is, a, this is a dark passage. It's a hard passage. I, I just couldn't bring myself to, uh, to leave us there in the dark place. So I'm going to go back and, and look at a couple of verses that I skipped over. Verse 19. He says, from now on, I'm telling you before it comes to pass so that when it does occur, you may believe that I am. What would you do if you found out that one of your close friends was going to some people who wanted to kill you and he was going to bring those people to kill you tomorrow night. What would you do? Run, right? Get in your car and drive far away. Call the police. You would not sit there and say, okay, here I am, come take me. That's foolish. We don't do that. Jesus does that. He knows exactly what's going to happen. He has said it. He's predicted it. My hour has come. He's been telling his disciples all along the way, I'm going to go to Jerusalem, and they're going to hand me over, and I'm going to be put on the cross. If you are a Jew reading this, remember this is 50 years after the fact. This is 50 years after the crucifixion, and you're a Jew reading the Gospel of John, and you're thinking, wait a minute, if Jesus knew this was going to happen. He even knew which of the disciples was going to betray him. Why did he not get out of Dodge? Jesus answers that question. I'm telling you beforehand so you will know that I am. Remember, we've seen that phrasing over and over again in the Gospel of John. This is another way that Jesus is proving that he's God. I'm telling you before the fact. We can't predict the future. Nobody knows what's going to happen later today. Nobody knows what's going to happen tomorrow. Nobody knows what's going to happen next week. We have our theories. We speculate. But nobody knows for sure. If you've seen the Back to the Future movies of a couple decades ago, great entertaining movies, remember the scene where, where one character gets the almanac of years down the road? And becomes a rich man because he's got it right there. What's going to happen? Who's going to win the, the sports events and so on? How many of us would love to have that? Just give, me, just give me one page of what's going to happen next year. I'd love to see that. We can't do that. Jesus declared exactly what was going to happen. I'm going to be crucified and I'm going to be handed over to the Jews by Judas Iscariot. Why can he do that? Because he's God. And he says, I want you to believe that I am. I'm telling you beforehand so that you will know. This is not an accident. No one takes Jesus' life from him. He gives it on purpose. He says, truly, truly, I say to you, he who receives whomever I send receives me, and he who receives me receives him who sent me. We've heard Jesus say something like this before, but let's make sure we understand the impact Jesus has been saying all along, I was sent from the Father. And the only way to get to the Father is through me. It's the only way. You cannot get to God through any other path. You have to come through me. He said that repeatedly, right? Now he adds, the way to get to me is through those I send. Do you do you realize the implication of those words for your New Testament? Think about how we know about Jesus. 
We don't know Jesus because he wrote a book or a movie was made about him or anything like that. We know about Jesus because he sent these men and others out to tell the story. And Jesus says, just like receiving me is receiving my father, receiving them is receiving me. How do we know about Jesus? How do we come to Jesus? Only through receiving those he sent. This is why we must preach and teach the New Testament to unbelievers. Because that's the only access we have to Jesus. Through their writings. And he sent these men out. Matthew went out preaching. Peter went out preaching. Paul went out preaching. And they also wrote it down. And for two millennia now, people have been reading these documents that the apostles of Jesus wrote. And if we receive them, we receive him. And if we receive him, we receive the Father. It is vital that we study, that we learn, that we believe the New Testament, and that we preach the New Testament to the world, because that is how people get to Jesus. The Apostle Paul, sent by Jesus, and he wrote many, many letters that we have. Peter wrote a couple of letters that we have. John wrote several letters that we have. Mark was a good friend of Peter and endorsed by Peter. Luke was a good friend of Paul, and he was endorsed by Paul. Jude and James were brothers of Jesus, who the church endorsed. And God in his providence brought all of these men together, their writings together, as those sent by Jesus. And if we receive them, we receive him. If we receive him, we receive God. The New Testament is Jesus' fulfillment of those words. Everyone who receives him, receives them, receives him. We cannot discard the New Testament and have Jesus. You don't get to make up whoever Jesus is in your own mind. You don't get to say, what does culture tell us Jesus is about? You don't get to say, who does the world say that Jesus is? None of that matters. It is irrelevant what I think about Jesus, what you think about Jesus, what America thinks about Jesus. Irrelevant. What matters is, What do the apostles think about Jesus? Because they were entrusted with the authority to speak the truth of what Jesus has said and done. And if we receive them, we receive him, we receive him, we receive the Father. Preach the New Testament. Study the New Testament. Proclaim the truths of the New Testament. Of course, the Old Testament is inspired scripture as well, but all the Old Testament points to the New Testament. When we want to convert somebody take them to the words of the apostles because they are the ones entrusted with the testimony of Jesus Christ. Preach the scriptures. And what do those scriptures contain? The good news of Jesus. Remember Paul, when he went to Corinth, he said, I only have one sermon, one message, one thing to tell you over and over and over again, Christ and him crucified. This very thing that Satan thought he was was doing to destroy God's plan became the only way God could bring about his plan. The only hope any of us have of forgiveness is that Jesus died on that cross. Jesus, who was betrayed by his close friend and handed over to the Jews, went to the cross and suffered wrath so that everyone who believes in him could be saved. That's our message. May we never get tired of hearing it, May we never get tired of proclaiming it because the apostles have revealed it to us and Jesus is exalted in it. Let's pray. Lord, it's a a sobering thing to know that one of your close associates, close friends, was a fraud the whole time. You've told us that in the midst of the church there will always be those who appear to be sheep, but who are really wolves. 
Lord, help us to be on guard, to not give them the opportunity to lead us astray. Lord, give us the humility to examine our own hearts and see if, if we are deceived to see where we may be playing the game of Christianity but not loyal to you. Lord, you have the power to turn any of us from darkness to light. Lord, we thank you for the word of God. We thank you for the scriptures. We thank you that for 2,000 years you have preserved these writings and that today we can read the word of the apostles which tell us about your salvation and your grace and the hope we have in Christ. May we read them and believe them and teach them and rejoice that our eternal destiny in heaven with you is secure. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.